let's have a look at a couple of exercises from section 4.3, starting with exercise 23. Um, this is a problem that's asking you to either write a proof or write a disproof, depending on whether the statement is true or false. Um, and this one happens to be true. So we're going to prove that a sufficient condition for an integer to be divisible by 8 is that it be divisible by 16. What I would recommend if you have a statement like this um, to consider writing it in if then form. And that applies anytime you have something where you're trying to prove a universal statement and it's not expressed as a conditional statement. Um, it's not something that you must do, but it's something that you might find helpful uh, to do before you begin the actual proof. So written in if-then form, if we think back to section 2.2 when we first learned about conditional statements, there's some discussion there about sufficient condition and how to uh, interpret that as, a, as an if-then statement. So the correct way to rewrite this is if an integer is divisible by 16, then it is divisible by 8 or something to that effect. Um, we don't have to, we know that we never have to have it in precisely the same words, but, um, but this is the if then form of that. Okay, so. We know when we start a direct proof here, we're going to suppose the if part of the conditional and use that to show the then part of the conditional. So with that in mind, uh, suppose n is an integer divisible by 16. By definition of divisibility, there exists an integer k such that n equals 16k. Okay, so that's directly taking from the definition of divisibility. Now we're going to do substitution. And we're interested in showing that n is 8 times an integer, because that would show that it's divisible by 8. So we really only have one step required to do that after we substitute, and that is to factor out the 8. Now we do need to explain why 2k is an integer. That's important because the definition of divisibility um, requires that we talk about an integer factor there. Uh, so let t equal 2k because products of integers are integers. t is an integer by definition of, definition of divisibility. n is divisible by 8, and that completes the proof. Okay, so pretty straightforward. Uh, you'll notice the structure of this proof is very similar to the other examples we've gone through in previous videos. Um, we you know, begin by supposing the if part of the conditional. We use a relevant definition. We do a little algebra, and then eventually we bring it back um, to the then part of the conditional, in this case by using that definition of divisibility a second time. The other example I want to look at with you from 4.3 is exercise 38. And this is an exercise that talks of or deals with the unique factorization of integers. Okay, that's a topic that's addressed in the last couple of pages in this section. And it helps us with some kind of interesting um, exercises, some of which I assigned for homework, some not. Um, but if you look through some of the, the exercises that, that deal with unique factorization there, um, I think some pretty interesting um, variety of examples. Let's take a look at this one. You have a similar one to this on your homework. Suppose that in standard factored form, a is equal to p1 to the e1 times p2 to the e2 times dot, 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 times pk to the ek. 
and here k is a positive integer, all the p sub 1 through sub k are prime numbers, and then the exponents are e sub 1 up through e sub k. Okay, those are positive integers. The, um, that's taking the integer a and factoring it into integer or prime factors. The unique factorization theorem tells us there's only one way to do that apart from reordering them. Okay, so you, of course you can rearrange the factors because multiplication is commutative, but you won't get different factors and you won't get them to different exponents. So part A says, what is the standard factored form of A squared? Okay, well, a squared, if a is an integer, a squared is also an integer, right? Because the integers are closed under multiplication. So there's only one way to factor a squared according to the unique factorization theorem. And here's where a rule of exponents will tell us exactly what the, the right answer is. Because if we square that expression that we had for a, what's going to happen is all those exponents will double. And that doesn't change the fact that all those bases, p sub 1, p sub 2, up through p sub k, those are prime numbers. They're still prime, right? If we square it, it doesn't change those numbers. So that must be the standard factored form of a squared. Okay, we're going to keep that in mind because that's going to help us do part B here. Find the least positive integer n such that 2 to the 5th times 3 times 5 squared times 7 to the 3rd times n is a perfect square. Write the resulting product as a perfect square. Okay, so upon first seeing this, you might think, how on earth am I going to figure out what the n is that they're looking for? Well, here's the key. The key is part a. Because part a shows us that to get a perfect square, what must be true is all of those exponents are even numbers. Notice it's 2 times e sub 1, 2 times e sub 2, 2 times e sub k. Those are all even. They all have that factor of 2. So in order for this product, 2 to the 5th times 3 times 5 squared times 7 to the 3rd times n, in order for that to be a perfect square, we need to make sure that all of those prime factors are raised to even exponents. And the way to do that with the smallest factor of n is to only uh, use uh, the prime factors in n, the minimum necessary to get those other exponents up to even numbers. So let me uh, give you an example to, to make it clear what I'm trying to say here. We've got 2 to the 5th. Okay, well, in order for that product to be a perfect square, if 2 is a factor, it must be 2 to an even exponent. And 5 is not even. So we know we need at least one other factor of 2 that would bump that up to 2 to the 6th power. And so n must include the factor 2. But we only want 2 to the 1st power there because anything bigger than that could potentially still give us a perfect square, but it will make n larger than it needs to be. Okay, so n must have a factor of 2 in it. What else has to be part of n? Well, n must have a factor of 3 because 3 to the first power does not have an even exponent. So we need to bump that power up by 1, which means n has to include the factor 3 in it. 5 squared, that has an even exponent, so we don't need to include the factor 5 in n, but we do need to include the factor 7 so that we can bump that power up from a 3 to a 4. So in other words, n 
is going to be 2 times 3 times 7, which is 42. Okay, so just to, to summarize what we're doing there, we wanted we knew what the prime factors uh, are for that, that uh, product apart from the n, but we knew that we needed any prime factor to be raised to an even exponent. So the job that n has is to increase any of those exponents up to an even integer if necessary. And the smallest n that accomplishes that is 2 times 3 times 7. Um, it says write the resulting product as a perfect square. So if we substitute in for n, that's going to give us our product as 2 to the 6th times 3 squared times 5 squared times 7 to the 4th. You multiply all that out, you get this large number here, 3,457,440, which has to be a perfect square because we set it up that way. And if you take the square root, you'll see that it's 5,880 squared is that number. Okay. These parts A and B are in the back of the book. Um, and, but part C is not. But you're going to see that part C is very similar to part B. Let's take a look. Part C says find the least positive integer m such that 2 squared times 3 to the 5th times 7 times 11 times m is a perfect square. Write the resulting product as a perfect square. So you might want to pause the video, jot down what you think m should be, and remember we want to be thinking in terms of the prime factors. So the Prime factors that are in that product before the M, we've got 2, we've got 3, we've got 7, we've got 11. So we're interested in what the exponents are associated with those prime factors. So we've got 2 squared. Well, that has an even exponent. So we're all set there. 2 does not have to be a factor of M. We have 3 to the 5th. Well, 5 is not even, so we need a factor of 3 to be part of m. We have 7 to the first, so we know we need a factor of 7 to be part of m, and we've got 11 to the first, so similarly we need 11 to be a factor of m. We want m to be as small as possible, okay, so the only way to do that with a positive integer m is to get 3 times 7 times 11, and that will give us a perfect square. And again, it asks us to write our answer as a perfect square, write that product. So once we multiply by m, we now have 2 squared times 3 to the 6th times 7 squared times 11 squared. That gives us our product there, which happens to be the square of 4,158. Okay, so kind of a different problem than anything we've seen before, and it's using this theorem, which of course we're seeing for the first time in this section, um, but one of the things again that I like about the unique factorization theorem is it allows us to kind of explore some different types of problems and maybe think about integers and factorization in a way that perhaps we haven't before. Uh, I hope you found this helpful. I'll see you in the next video.